Hello and welcome to episode number two of the Joe Cannon Health Podcast. I am Joe Cannon and in today's episode I want to talk about something that most people dread getting and that's Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is a devastating condition which I'm sure everybody has heard about and what I want to do in this episode is talk about some research, some intriguing research that hints that there may be something in your kitchen right now which may produce predict your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease and talk about that research and after that cover some actionable tips and steps you can take right now which can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's. I think that's actually quite important because I don't think most people take Alzheimer's disease seriously. Um, it, it, this, is a, this is a health condition that has been around for over 100 years. It was first diagnosed by Dr. Alzheimer, that's where it got his name from, in 1906. And today, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in, uh, in America. And it happens to be the fifth leading cause of death in those over the age of 65. So in those people who are over the age of 65, the fifth leading cause of them kicking the bucket is Alzheimer's. That, I think, is, is unfathomable for most people. In 2014, there were 5 million people in America with Alzheimer's disease. And while that's bad, this number is expected to jump to 14 million people by the year 2060. Uh, as, as you can imagine, this disorder is taking a gigantic toll on the health care budget of America. In 2010, Alzheimer's disease uh, cost the health system between 159 billion and 215 billion every year to uh, deal with the ravages of Alzheimer's and this number is expected to jump to over 500 billion dollars a year by the year 2040. That's amazing. 2040 is just around the corner. So again, very, very serious uh, disorder, um, and that's why I think this episode is very worthy of your listening time. Um, so what I want to do now is talk about how we might predict the risk of Alzheimer's. This research is actually quite intriguing, uh, and, and it stems from the observation that one of the first signs of Alzheimer's appears to be a change in the sense of smell people with Alzheimer's disease don't smell odors as well as those who do not have Alzheimer's disease. And this has led researchers to do some interesting uh, investigations. And, and the study which got all the attention came out in 2013, and it was simply titled, A Brief Olfactory Test for Alzheimer's Disease. What? Apparently, uh, there may be a simple test, according to these researchers. So what did they do? Well, these researchers recruited about 68 people and they broke them up into different groups. They had a group that was probable for Alzheimer's. They were showing all the telltale signs and they had other people who had mild uh, memory deficits, what they call mild um, cognitive impairment, um, and, and other people who had other forms of dementia. And they compared these individuals to people who did not have dementia, who did not have Alzheimer's disease. So what did they do? Well, they got peanut butter. Yes, peanut butter. Regular plain peanut butter. And what they do is they took a half an ounce of peanut butter uh, and they put it on a ruler. And they what they did was they had the people close their eyes, close their mouth, and put one finger over a nostril so they could only breathe out of the left nostril or the right nostril. And slowly the researchers would bring the peanut butter closer and closer to the people's noses. And what they found was quite interesting. They discovered that people who had Alzheimer's disease could not smell peanut butter until it was only two inches away from their left nostril. All right. So in people who did not have Alzheimer's disease, they could smell the peanut butter when it was seven inches away. But if they had Alzheimer's, they had peanut butter to be very, very close 
two inches from their nostril. That's five centimeters for those who are outside the U.S. listening to me. Okay, so that's quite interesting. And this study actually made the headlines. I remember when this study came out a few years ago, all the news, news reports were talking about it. It was on TV, radio, you name it. Quite and quite interesting um, that there might be a simple predictive test for Alzheimer's. And that's actually pretty important because if you could predict who was going to get Alzheimer's, well, then you could take intervention steps now to reduce somebody's risk in the future. And this could mean lots of money saved in healthcare costs, you know, decades down the road. Okay, so as much publicity as this study got, and it got a lot, believe me, the uh, researcher, another group of researchers came about a year later in 2014, and they said, let's see if we can replicate the findings of this very intriguing study. Because that's how we figure out if, science, if, if something works or not. You do the same thing as other researchers and you try to replicate their findings. And so these other researchers uh, in 2014, they used the same amount of people. They broke up in the same groups, uh, probable Alzheimer's, mild cognitive impairment, etc., and compared them to uh, healthy older adults. They did the same thing with the peanut butter. Uh, they used a half, a half an ounce of peanut butter, put it on a ruler. The only difference I noticed here was that instead of having people plug up their nostril with their finger, they actually covered the, uh, uh, the nostrils with uh, surgical tape. Okay, um, that, that seems to be the only difference that I could discern when I read the research. So what did these other group of researchers find? no association between peanut butter and Alzheimer's disease. They, they said, we don't know what's going on. We couldn't find the same thing. We could not replicate the findings. In this study, people who had Alzheimer's didn't smell peanut butter any uh, closer or further away than people who did not have Alzheimer's disease. So where does this lead us? Right now, Looks like we got one study saying, yes, uh, peanut butter, inability to smell peanut butter is predictive to Alzheimer's. Um, actually, 100% predictive. That's something I left out of the uh, summary of the first study. These researchers said it was 100% predictive for Alzheimer's disease. All right? And these other researchers coming out a year later saying, we can't replicate the findings. We don't know what's going on, but we didn't find the same results. So really that leaves us with, we need, we need more studies. Uh, nobody really can tell you if your inability to smell peanut butter means you're going to get Alzheimer's or not. Um, it would take more studies. And, there, and right now there doesn't appear to be any other investigations on this. So I can't tell you if, you, if, if smelling peanut butter or inability to smelling peanut butter means you will or will not get Alzheimer's in the future. But what if you went into your kitchen tonight and uh, you, you tried to do this test for yourself where, you know, maybe your, your friend or spouse, you know, they brought the peanut butter close to you. Suppose, for instance, you flunked the test. You couldn't smell peanut butter until it was really close to your nostril, maybe two inches or so. Does that mean that you might get Alzheimer's disease in the future? I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but I think that it's it, it's something that uh, I, I, I want to bring about because if you've heard about this uh, invest, these investigations, you may try it and get freaked out. So what I, would, I really wanted to try to level the playing field and say, right now, we don't know either way if it's predictive or not. It's going to take more studies. But having said that, is there some things that we can do today which could reduce the odds of getting Alzheimer's disease in the future, whether you could smell peanut butter or not? Fortunately, there are some lifestyle changes, some things you can do today, which we know will reduce your risk of Alzheimer's. As a matter of fact, it's estimated that lifestyle modifications, changing the way we live and changing the way we do things, can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's by as much as 60%. That's huge. There's no drug that'll reduce the risk of, of Alzheimer's by 60%, but the way we live our lives can appears to be able to do this by as much as 60%. So what are these lifestyle modifications that we can do today to lower our risk? So there, there's essentially like six of them here I've listed. Um, number one is exercise. We know that exercise has a dramatic effect on health. Uh, it has a, has a wide array of ramifications for uh, living a, a, a longer life and a healthier life. And there is evidence that exercise can lower the risk of dementia, all forms of dementia, including Alzheimer's. Why? Well, as I say in seminars I give, there is an intimate relationship between heart health and brain health. What's good for the heart tends to be good for the brain as well. 
And it's complicated why that most likely is. It could be because exercise is bringing more blood flow to the brain and with blood become, comes oxygen and nutrients and, and, and stuff like that. That's one possible way that exercise could be uh, beneficial to brain health. Another possible way is that exercise also improves blood vessel growth and uh, that's technically called angiogenesis. Exercise increases, improves the blood vessel growth of the body and, and more blood vessels in the brain could mean more blood delivery to brain cells. That's one possible way as well. Another way, and this is something that I think most people are not aware of, exercise can grow new brain cells. And that's actually uh, a revolutionary concept that when, when I was in college, nobody was even talking about this. It was thought that when you're born, you're born with a certain amount of brain cells and then you, you lose thousands of them every day and that's the end of it. You can never grow brain cells back. We now know that's not true. Exercise, regular physical activity can grow new brain cells. So this may be another way that exercise might offset Alzheimer's and dementia in the future because as we're losing brain cells, if you're exercising regularly, you're building more brain cells up. So it could be that this improvement in brain cell growth could offset any kind of loss we might have as we get older. That's another possible way as well. So I think it's actually important to keep in the back of your mind. We normally don't think about exercises being able to grow brain cells, but that is something that we know can happen. All right, so I'm always going to put exercise at the top of this list because I, I, I think most Americans don't get enough physical activity. How much exercise are we talking about here? Uh, not a lot, actually. Average, average American only gets around 20 minutes of exercise a day. Uh, the, the, the minimum goal is 30 minutes a day. Uh, so, you know, if you were to, for instance, you know, take a 10 minute walk in the morning, a 10 minute walk in the afternoon, a 10 minute walk in the evening, you've accumulated your 30 minutes. You do, you do that five days a week. That's 150 minutes of exercise a week. And that's the minimum goal for physical activity, 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. Now, I use the word moderate on purpose because uh, we've heard that, you probably hear that on news, news organizations, stations, et cetera. You know, you got to get moderate exercise. What the heck is moderate exercise? Moderate exercise occurs when you're, you can carry on a conversation while you're exercising. So uh, it, it, basically, I can hear you breathing, but you can still talk to me while you're exercising. That's the simplest definition of moderate intensity exercise. So if you can do 30 minutes a day, five days a week, you're right there at the national average, average and that's going to help reduce, uh, reduce Alzheimer's disease risk in the future. Now, number two, sleep better, sleep more. Most people are not getting enough sleep. Um, it, it's, it's complicated in the 21st century. You know, we're, we're always under the pressure of doing this, that, and the other thing. We go to bed, we watch, you know, TV in bed. So what I would suggest, it's difficult to do, uh, but again, turn off the TV, make sure you've got, you know, drapes and blinds that'll block out the sunlight. You want to have as much darkness in that room as you possibly can. That's going to help bolster your melatonin level. Melatonin's a hormone that made in your brain that, you know, helps you get to sleep. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's really something that, that is important. If you have an alarm clock, maybe get an alarm clock where you can dim the display. Uh, so anything that's going to reduce the the light in your in your bedroom is a good thing again if you can keep the temperature low put the air conditioner on that's going to help us sleep better as well but again that's important because during sleep our brain doesn't shut off uh, when we are asleep our brain is reorganizing itself putting everything back to where it needs to get you know I, I liken sleep to kind of like when you reboot your computer or you reboot your phone you turn it on you turn it back off and everything gets back to where it, where it was in the beginning and that's kind of what happens when we get to sleep. So if we don't sleep enough, our brain doesn't get rebooted. Uh, and over time, this could lead to uh, various uh, issues arising, which down the road could increase the risk of, of dementia and Alzheimer's. So uh, sleeping better, I think, is, de is something that we don't really think about with Alzheimer's, but it is, it is definitely important to sleep more. Um, now, another thing that we should be looking at if we're trying to reduce the incidence of dementia and Alzheimer's is we got to get out more with meat 
with people. We got to get out with friends. We got to do things. A social interaction, I, I think, is something we are unfortunately losing in the 21st century. And, and I think that's true because, you know, just go outside and look around and look what people are doing. They're not looking at each other, they're not talking to each other. They're on their stinking phones. I, I see people at restaurants where, you know, there's, there's five, six, seven people at the table and they're all looking at their phone. I've seen mom and dads walking down the street, you know, with little children in a baby carriage or holding on to them. They're not talking to the kids. They're looking at their dopey phone. These phones are like crack or heroin. They are addicting. And, you know, I don't want to go off a deep end about this and get on a soapbox, but it really is true. The proof's in the pudding. Just go out and look. You'll see for yourself. People don't talk. They look at these phones. Now, why is that a problem? Well, I, there is evidence now, and, and we know this from MRI scans of brains uh, of individuals, the more screen time you have, the more you're looking at a screen, whether it's a phone, a tablet, a PC, whatever, this appears to change the physiology of the brain. There have been MRI scans of people, uh, and, and they note that the more screen time they have, the more changes you can actually see in the brain. What does this mean? I don't know. Uh, there, there was a story on, on 60 Minutes a while ago which, which tackled this issue. Um, and they were looking at children and screen time. And I, was, I, I thought it was very telling that when they literally put the question to the researcher, what does this mean? You know, the researcher didn't really want to come out and say, don't look at your phone, put it away, stop, you know, get, you know, you know, spend as little screen time as possible. But that's the take home message I got. What is the ultimate ramifications of a generation of people who are constantly on their phone, on their tablet, etc.? Is it possible that the alteration of the physiology of the brain through all this screen time will increase the risk of dementia in the future? I don't know. I'm, I know I'm making a leap when I say this, but I, I, again, I keep coming back to that 60 minute story where you could see the changes in the brain. And again, we don't know what this means. And, and so I think that getting, getting away from the phones, put them in your pocket, leave, you know, leave them in your car, whatever, get out and talk with people. Uh, it's a big difference talking to a, a living, breathing human being than looking, you know, at, at, at the phone on, on social media, because you're not having that real direct contact with somebody, you know? So again, I, again, I know I, it may seem like I'm diverting away from the Alzheimer's topic, but I really do think this is important. And this is a topic that nobody's really addressing. And so I really want you to think about the screen time you have. There's even apps now on your phone where you can, you can see how much time you're looking at different apps, for instance. Um, so again, if you can do that, I think that's really going to be a, a good thing. And, and I, and I do think that eventually we're going to have a better idea of what all this screen time means in terms of physiological changes in the, in the brain. But again, social interaction, definitely big. Get out with friends, get out with people, do things, go to baseball games, go to parties, whatever. Okay. No, number, number four, learning a new skill. We know that uh, you, you build new neurological pathways when you do things you're not used to doing whether it's taking uh, a new route to work or maybe you know t trying to dribble a basketball with your non-dominant hand, uh, trying to write with a non-dominant hand, for instance, maybe doing exercises that you're not used to doing. For instance, if you're always on the treadmill, try the elliptical, for instance. Your, your brain will adapt to these new activities that you're doing, these new skills you're learning. Uh, and again, this is going to help foster new neurological connections between brain cells. Uh, again, learning a new language, for instance, learn to play the piano or the violin, uh, learning to do a podcast in my case. Uh, again, all these things stretches the brain and, and the brain has this, has this pliability effect. It can, it can stretch to new dimensions. And again, there is evidence that this can help keep you mentally supple uh, as, our, as our years grow. All right, so learning a new skill, activity, whatever, I think is a, is a good thing. 
Number, number five here is stress reduction. This is arguably the most difficult thing to do in the 21st century. Anything we could do to reduce our stress load uh, can be a good thing. Because stress could increase the inflammation of the body. Uh, and again, that's not a good thing because it turns out that Alzheimer's itself appears to be geared towards uh, an increase in inflammation in the brain. And all these things we're talking about are really designed to, you know, in addition to other things, reduce the inflammation. So if we could reduce the inflammation, we might, again, help reduce the risk of getting dementia and Alzheimer's. And so reducing stress is huge. Uh, and again, I know it's very difficult. So that's why, you know, I put exercise first. Exercise is great for reducing inflammation. You know, it, 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 in addition to the other things we talk about, it can also reduce cellular inflammation. Oh, and, and as an aside, if you're wondering to yourself, how do I know if I've got inflammation or not? Well, there is a blood test that you may request from your, from your doctor. Uh, they probably won't do this unless you request it, but it is called this CRP test, the letter C. RP and they stand for C the letter C reactive protein okay and CRP levels uh, by measuring them this can give us an idea of what your level of inflammation is okay and so higher levels of CRP are usually indicative of having like a low grade inflammation it's not like you have a fever or anything like that. You can't tell it by you know, using a thermometer or something like that, but uh, it's a low-grade inflammation. And many diseases are linked to having this low-grade inflammation, cancer, heart disease, et cetera. They have, that, they have this inflammation link, which again is you know, not surprising that the research is showing Alzheimer's does too. So again, it's something you can request from your doctor. Again, it's just as an aside, it came to me as I was talking. But uh, again, reducing stress, come back, come back full circle, but reducing stress again. We're talking exercise. We're talking, hey, massage. Massages are great. Uh, prayer, meditation, uh, again, walking, anything you can do to, you know, to, to reduce the stress, whatever it is that makes you feel better. I think that's a, that's a great step in the right direction. Again, I know stress reduction is very difficult. We're constantly bombarded with different things that are calling our attention. But again, if you can even get away for like 10, 15 minutes, you know, by yourself, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a silent room, just to meditate or pray for a few minutes a day. I think that's going to go a long way to helping you. Okay, so stress reduction. So we've got exercise, we've got sleep better if you possibly can, uh, social interactions, absolutely, learning a new skill, stress reduction. And then rounding out this, this bunch of six topics to reduce uh, inflammation and, and, and hopefully reduce the risk of Alzheimer's is eating better. Uh, I, 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 I think it's interesting that most Americans, and, and again, I think also most first world countries as well, they don't eat enough fruits and veggies and beans and seeds and, and nuts. We eat processed foods. We eat foods that come in a can or a box or a package, you know, fast food, stuff like that. Um, and, and we don't eat enough foods that can grow on the ground and growing trees and, 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 and whatnot. Now, there is evidence that, you know, diseases are linked to not only not so much eating bad stuff, but not eating enough good stuff. So it doesn't mean you can't go have, you know, have a cheeseburger once in a while or something like that, but throw some broccoli on, on that cheeseburger, some spinach or something like that. Most people don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. Now, why in the world would fruits and veggies and seeds and beans, why could they help reduce uh, inflammation and how could they might reduce the risk of Alzheimer's? Well, there are studies showing people who eat more fruits and veggies get less dementia, get less Alzheimer's. There's multiple studies that do show this. So right off the bat, uh, the proof is in the pudding with the studies. But why? Well, it, it's a complicated issue. Uh, one thing I would point out is that fruits and veggies and beans and seeds. These are, these are generally colorful foods um, and the colors are often the antioxidants. So when you see, you know, blueberries and strawberries, why are they blue? Why are they red and green, etc.? Those colors are antioxidants. And when you eat uh, those plant antioxidant nutrients, we then get the power of those plants and they do things inside of us. Just as those, those colors, those antioxidants, protect the plants from environmental toxins, uh, when we eat them, they tend to prevent us from getting sick too. So that's one possible way. Uh, another possible way is that what do fruits and veggies and beans and seeds tend to have in common? They all have fiber. 
Now, fiber, again, I, I don't think it's a lot of attention uh, in the general public because you know, think, oh, fiber, you know, makes you go to the bathroom. Okay, that's great, but what else does it do? Well, fiber is food to your microbiome. And, and, and that's actually what, obviously a, a topic for a whole other discussion, but the microbiome are these, these bacteria that live inside of us, actually on us as well, but if they're actually in our large intestine. It's estimated that all of us have about three pounds of bacteria living in our large intestine, our colon. And what do these bacteria like to eat? Fiber. And, and so that's why if you paid attention to like the supplement world, you may have heard the term prebiotic. You know, they'll say our supplement has prebiotics. What's a prebiotic? Fiber. And so when we eat these fibrous foods, the microbiome then eat the fiber and they in turn give off compounds that we in turn use to stay healthy. For instance, uh, we know that, that, that microbiome will give off compounds called short chain fatty acids. And, and again, these are fats, they're fatty acids, but they're not long chain fats or not medium chain fats. They're short. They're short. They're shorty fats. And we then use some of these fats to do things. For instance, um, it's, it's thought that these uh, short chain fatty acids are one of the reasons why eating a high fiber diet protects us in many cases from getting colon cancer. And it's quite possible that the microbiome release other compounds, which may in turn reduce our risk of dementia and Alzheimer's and cancer, et cetera. And obviously, it's a very burgeoning field, the whole microbiome thing. You know, even as far back as, you know, year 2000 or so, nobody was talking about this stuff. And, you know, now it's, oh, microbiome this, microbiome that. I think we still have a long way of going. Uh, and I, that's why I, I would resist from, say, taking a, a probiotic supplement because I don't think we understand all that stuff yet. Um, so I would say the easiest way to change your microbiome for the better is just to eat more fruits and veggies and seeds and beans. Okay. So I, I, I as much as I think the peanut butter smell test for Alzheimer's disease is fascinating, um, I don't want you to freak out if you flunk that test, if you decide to do it after listening to this episode. Just realize that there are some things you can do today, which we know for a fact will lower your risk of not only Alzheimer's disease, but heart disease and diabetes and cancer and, and, and high blood pressure, etc. And again, it's, it's fairly simple steps you know, exercise, sleep more, you know, have more friends, do more social interactions, you know, learning new, new, new skills, reducing stress and, and again, eating better. Uh, I think, I think going, you know, if we can do some of those things, that's going to go a long way to reducing the risk of dementia, Alzheimer's, and pretty much every other health problem that's out there. So that, I hope this really helped you better understand the peanut butter smell test, as I call it, for Alzheimer's disease, and also give you some uh, things to think about in terms of how you might reduce your risk of dementia and other diseases as well. Um, that's all I got for you for this week. Uh, I do want to leave you with the quote of the day, and that comes from the Canadian politician Charlotte Witten, who said, we all have abilities. The difference is in how we use them. Okay, guys, that's all I got for you. Until next time, I'm Joe Cannon. Go out and make a difference.